Good morning. Welcome to Sipperman's Compliance Webinar on how to prepare for a regulatory exam. My name is Rob Prusnell and thank you for joining us today. We have a content-rich program filled with insights and practical experiences that will help you prepare for a future regulatory exam. We have a couple promises. One is to stay on track and two is to make sure we can conclude our program in less than an hour and of course deliver you great content in between. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to cover just a few housekeeping items. First, feel free to uh, submit your questions throughout the program. You're able to do this if you look at the right-hand side of uh, your screen. Due to the size of our audience, we'll get to as many questions as we can throughout the program as, as well as, as at the end. Additionally, uh, look for several polling questions that will be coming your way and we would appreciate your participation again throughout the presentation. I will share with you the results of, of those polls as we go along. For those of you who don't know Sipperman Compliance, we are an organization dedicated to working with investment firms in need of regulatory compliance help. We are unique in many ways, but we are one of the only few organizations where you can outsource your chief compliance officer responsibilities. Additionally, as an option, if you have an in-house chief compliance officer, we can also take on a support role in, in supporting uh, your, your in-house resource. We have over 85 clients uh, uh, that we engage with, and uh, interestingly, and although we're indifferent to what you buy from us, whether it's an outsourced CCO role or support, two-thirds of our clients select us and use us in an outsourced CCO capacity. Okay, enough of the, of the housekeeping. Let's get started with our program. We have three distinguished panelists with us today from the Sipperman team, uh, John Wowak, Doug Tyre, and Jay Haas. We have served, uh, we all have served, they all have served as CCO up close and personal in, in their careers, and so the information they'll share with you comes with, with both passion and expertise. Today's event is broken up into five sections, uh, which includes time at the end for the submitted questions that you've, you've sent to us. First, Doug will speak to us about the changing paradigm of compliance examinations. John will then address how to analyze and manage an examination. Then Jay will share with us his experience of the regulator's approach and focus of key examination areas. Uh, as we go along, our panel will then uh, come together and share some short stories with you about some recent experience they've had in preparing and, and the live activity that's gone on uh, in, in one of their examinations. And as I mentioned earlier, we will at the end uh, handle questions that you've submitted through the program. So let's get started. Doug, let me hand the microphone off over to you. Great. Thank you, Rob. And thank you, everyone, for attending our presentation today. As Rob mentioned, I'll be discussing with you our observations regarding a recent shift to a risk-based approach in which regulators have been conducting examinations for some of our clients. As a firm, we have noticed that examiners have increasingly conducted larger portions of their examinations remotely via correspondence and electronic delivery of documents. While the on-site portion of the examinations have tended to decrease in length, it is worth noting that with this increased use of electronic communications and delivery capabilities, the examination process can still go on for months, as this, is, as this change has facilitated a more efficient delivery process, which ultimately allows the examiners greater ease in sending follow-up requests or correspondence during the course of an examination. Regulators have also invested significantly in technology to enhance their ability to leverage data received from registrants as well as the greater market. With their data analysis capabilities being greater now than ever before, regulators have more tools at their disposal to identify market participants that may exhibit a higher risk profile based on its activities. To those registrants in which regu regulators identify as higher risks, they may be more likely candidates for an examination that's focused on their business practices that regulators deem to pose a higher risk to the investing public. As a firm, we have observed recently that the nature of examinations has typically become more focused in scope. 
with the examiners, rather than asking for a long list of documents sweeping across various areas of the firm's operations, had instead begun deeper dives on a more focused and targeted scope of the firm's operations. A prominent and current example of this type of examination are the cybersecurity sweep examinations that the SEC has conducted over the last few years in response to their making cybersecurity a top regulatory priority. Another example in which we at Sipperman have been involved was for a client's recent examination that was focused on the liquidation of a subadvised mutual fund. With this focused examination, our client, who served as the advisor and not the subadvisor to the fund, was asked to produce a multitude of documents concerning best execution, particularly related to its oversight of the subadvisor's best execution and brokerage, act, brokerage allocation practices for the trades executed to liquidate the fund. The focused nature of this examination led to an increased burden for our client to produce a wide array of documents specifically centered on its oversight of the subadvisor all at a much more profound level than would have been expected under a water scope examination that would have covered a wider range of our clients' operations. So what does all this mean? While less areas of your firm are maybe likely to be examined in these types of examinations, the deeper dive in the areas of the examiner's focus present additional opportunities for the examiners to notice underlying issues, which ultimately helps them get, them, helps them get their foot in the door and expand the scope of their examination. So what can, what can you and your firm do to prepare for this type of examination? I'm gonna follow with three different topics uh, uh, that you should consider when, when preparing for a potential exam. First, know the regulator's examination priorities. Every January, both the SEC and FINRA publish their annual examination priorities. When this is published, you should, assess, you should read the examination priorities letters and assess any areas that may be applicable to your line of business. Any overlap between regulatory priorities and your line of business will very likely be areas, be areas of focus on a regulatory exam. An example of this would be retirement assets. Uh, there's been a great deal of emphasis placed by the regulators on the management of any retirement assets like IRA accounts for individual investors or if you manage institutional accounts for public pension plans. You know, if either of those, you know, in the case of the retirement assets, if your line of business is involved in any of those areas, that could be a very likely candidate. And as I mentioned before, cybersecurity has been a recent hot topic and continues to be an area of focus with both, you know, with, but with all major regulators, you know, FINRA and the SEC, to name a few. The second area I'm going to cover is to be aware of any prior, examiners, prior examination results your firm may have. This is sort of low-hanging fruit. So if a new examination team comes in, this will be the first, one of the first areas that they'll go to to see, to assess, you know, how, how compliant your firm has been. So in the event that your firm has previously undergone an exam and received a deficiency letter, you need to ensure that appropriate procedures and documentation exist to substantiate your firm's remediation of those findings. As a compliance professional, you should ask yourself the following questions. Do the corrective actions we've taken adequately address their findings? Have these corrective actions been applied consistently and are they fully incorporated and entrenched within our operations? And lastly, do we have documentation of the corrective actions that we've implemented to address these prior deficiencies? Failure to adequately remediate any prior examination findings will more likely than not lead to enhanced scrutiny, potential sanctions, fines, or even referral to enforcement by the new examination team. And the third area uh, that I'm going to discuss is to fully know your business's key risks. To do this, you know, we recommend that you have a robust internal risk assessment process that identifies and outlines any policies and procedures that you have designed to mitigate the key risks that are inherent with your business. With these policies and procedures, you know, it's also important to ensure that you have the appropriate documentation to evidence that these processes you've enacted are being carried out and that they are designed specifically to mitigate those key risks. So when you put this all together, you know, by looking at what the re current regulatory priorities are, examining and making sure you've assessed any prior findings you've had in an examination, and also fully assessing uh, the risks related to your, your specific firm's business, all three of these areas, when you look at them in total, uh, you know, in the event that you were to be, uh, your firm were to be 
the candidate for an examination, all these areas would come in, potentially come into play for that exam. Okay, great. Thanks, Doug. So the first polling question came out. Let me just read it once again. Have you read the 2017 regulatory exam priorities? So these came out in January. You should congratulate yourself, all of you listening in. About 80% of you, in fact, have read uh, those priorities. Pretty good. Thank you. So, John, uh, how about you take over? Thanks, Rob. We should all remember that any regulatory examination in any form should be taken very seriously. How an exam is handled is sometimes just as important as the data and information provided to the regulators. Doug covered the an anticipation of an exam and things that you can do as a firm, and I'll review the next steps in the process, which include the notification of the exam, the preparation phase, and the management of the on-site visit. The commencement of an exam may happen in a few ways, a phone call, a letter, or sometimes both. Exams can be routine, for cause, or part of an industry sweep, as Doug alluded to, being the cybersecurity sweeps. In rare circumstances, a surprise visit to the office may occur to kick off a regulatory review. The lead examiner may call the CCO or another exe executive of your firm to introduce themselves and learn more about the firm. This conversation is usually followed by a letter addressed to the CCO or the main principal of the firm, which will include a document request listing for items pertinent to the firm's business. There's no need to panic at this point as most exams are routine. Most of what we are seeing are routine in nature and very, follow a very specific workflow leading up to the on-site exam. You may ask, what do I do now? Some of you may have had an exam already, some may not and are anticipating one. The immediate focus once an exam kicks off should be on the preparation and organization of information to be provided to the regulators. At this point, all senior management should be notified and look to take a very active role in the process. I will now cover some important work steps that you should consider as you organize and prepare for the exam. The first thing you should do is analyze the letter and data request. The initial request could be a general listing of five to 10 things or a more comprehensive listing of 40 to 50 items. You should review the letter and assess it for themes or consistent topics. That will help you understand if the exam is targeting a specific area of your business. Also pay very close attention to the exam period so that the information provided and reviewed and given to the regulators is limited to the time period under review. Once you've analyzed the letter, identify a point person or coordinator, usually the CCO or your consultant, that will ensure that the request listing is met and will be the primary communicator with the exam team. The point person will act as the gatekeeper of the documents and handle all responses to the regulators. This point person will also assign responsibilities for gathering the documentation. All data should be reviewed prior to be provided to the regulators. The underlying quality of the documents would be the process owner's responsibility, while this point person should ensure that the info meets the criteria of the regulators. A period of internal back and forth may occur, but ultimately the documentation should be provided by the gatekeeper. From here, the firm should create an action plan, whether formal or informally, for the interim period between the receipt of the letter and any on-site exam to occur. A timeline of events should include deadlines, key meeting dates and times, and any other items that need to be addressed for the exam. Within this action plan, two additional considerations should be, should be reviewed. You should review, as Doug said, any prior regulatory letters or communications you have received, and also coordinate with your consultants and any legal teams. Ensuring the past regulatory exam communications, whether they were findings, recommendations, observations, or deficiencies, were adequately addressed, will be a main emphasis of the new exam team. In addition, if there are key areas handled by outside consultants or lawyers, those areas need to be discussed with them in this planning phase. Now that your action plan is ready and be put in place, I'll share a few items that will help you prepare you and your firm for the actual review or exam. It is assumed that the regulatory team has, prepared, has reviewed all public disclosures regarding your firm. These items may include the ADV, the website, 
and all documentation provided them prior to their visit. The examiners will develop an understanding of your business based on what information they have reviewed. With that said, preparing and sharing an overview of your business that clearly articulates what your firm does and how the investment strategy is executed may be a way to ensure you and the exam team are on the same page when it comes to your business. The examiners will always identify key business risks and attempt to understand the way these risks are mitigated by your firm. This is done through their, through their lens or their experiences. You should identify company reps that have a clear understanding of your business policies and procedures that surround these key risk areas. The rep should also be able to clearly describe your firm's business and can interact with the staff on a professional level. They should also be able to demonstrate a culture of compliance within the execution of these key business processes and your strategies. Aside from the key company reps, a good practice would be to notify and prepare everyone. Have them re-review -re all policies and procedures. Let them know when the regulators will be on site. Hold practice meetings or mock interviews to help them prepare should the exam staff request a meeting with them. Most of the clients here at Sifferman invite us to help with these trainings and prepare me and prep meetings prior to the exam so that we can share our experience with the employees and help give them a sense on how the exam meetings may play out. The next focus area should be on the documentation and data fulfillment process. The exam staff is usually looking for timely, accurate responses. A word of caution here, hastily providing inaccurate or wrong information to them will not earn you any brownie points. Accuracy, not speed, should be the goal when fulfilling a document request list. If you are worried about the deadlines the exam team set or unsure when to provide certain information to them, open a direct line of communication with the lead examiner and set expectations from the start. Aside from the quality control review of the data itself, a consistency review should take place prior to providing to the regulators. This may include triangulating information with your public disclosures, your regulatory filings, and any internal compliance manuals or policies that you've written. Catching discrepancies in the information prior to providing to the examiners may help when and if it becomes a focus of them. Another key item to consider when preparing for the exam is to develop an agenda with examiners ahead of time in order to avoid conflicts with key personnel or overlaps with your client commitments. Although not always a successful approach, this will at least demonstrate to the exam team that you are making every attempt to make sure key people are available and that your client business is operating as normal. Once the on-site visit exam dates are finalized and the action plan is put in place, all key executives should calendars should be adjusted and accommodate for their meeting requests. I believe it goes without saying, but you should not schedule any client visits while the examiners are on site. Prior to the on-site exam, take the necessary security measures to ensure that sensitive data and client information is both physically and virtually protected. This may include implementing a clean desk policy to ensuring that your staff does not to ensure your staff does not leave out in plain sight any sensitive information that an examiner may stumble upon. Additional office security may be over IT equipment, client fi actual client print files, or other data or areas that contain sensitive information. Make sure your rooms or areas that should be locked are locked. Also ensure that the examiners are met with some type of security clearance upon entering the building or your office space. Once on site, ensure any and all inter interaction with the team is professional and courteous. Limit personal discussions or sharing the opinions with sharing your opinions with the exam team members. Upon introductions, you should gain a feel of the approachability of the staff and you can adjust your interactions accordingly. You should also request their business cards so that you can understand their role on the exam team and their role within their, the organization or the regulated agency. Another good practice is to have the CCO present at all meetings. The regulators do not object to this. Having the CCO there will give a consistent presence during the meetings. 
The CCO should take notes of questions asked, responses given, and then have an internal briefing with after key meetings so that you can ensure consistent me messaging is being given. As with any regulatory oversight or government agency, give honest, direct answers to their inquiries. This simply means answering a yes-no question with a yes or no. There is no need to elaborate, elaborate until you are asked to. If a mistake is made or inaccurate information is given, correct the record immediately. Also, do not over-communicate. Give short, succinct answers. Remember that you're not giving a sales presentation, but rather talking to a regulator that governs the business that you are part of. Again, if you don't know the answer, say so. Let them know you will research and provide the answer in a timely fashion. Also, if you are unclear as to what the exam staff is asking for or are confused, ask them for the request in writing. This will help you narrow down what they are looking for. If anything is provided to the exam staff off the cuff or while on site, make sure you retain copies of exactly what you've given to them. Another item that should be considered when the exam takes place is the Freedom of Information Act and the impact of the data you are providing becoming public. You should discuss this with your counsel on how to proceed when informed of the examination. Hopefully by now you have a sense of how to handle the exam from the moment you are notified to the minute the exam staff walks through your doors. Okay, great. Thank you, John. So our next polling question, uh, thank you for those who have answered. What's your, uh, when was your uh, last examination? So here are the numbers, how they came out. During 2017, 29% of you uh, on the phone today are in midst of or have had an exam. In 2016, 17% of you had exams. 2015, this is really an interesting number, 2% of you have had exams. Prior to 2015, 40%, and then, uh, uh, about 16% of you are unsure of uh, when your last exam was. So uh, good information. We, we are often asked, when might we expect to have an exam at, at our firm? Our answer is you just don't know. Uh, so you have to be constantly uh, improving your program and be prepared at, at any time. I'd also like to suggest before I hand over uh, the microphone to Jay that uh, we are accepting questions. We'd appreciate you submitting those. We'll be getting to them in, in a little bit, but uh, we are taking those down and we'll be happy to answer those uh, as we go along here. Jay, microphone, microphone's yours. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about core exam focus areas. And, and um, over the course of the past two years, uh, CCS has assisted our clients and participated in over 30 regulatory examinations. Doug discussed the changes we've observed in the regulatory approach to exams, and we have seen a similar change in the exam focus areas. The regulators have implemented a risk-based approach where they target specific areas of the firm's business and products. I'll discuss a few of the common exam focus areas we have observed recently. First area of focus I'll address is the WSP, Written Supervisory Procedures, or Compliance Manual. This is not a new area of regulatory review, but rather an item that is always an area of focus. As you're aware, the compliance manual should be the backbone of your compliance program, as it describes in detail the who, what, when, and how of your supervisory process. Typically, this is the first document, or at least one of the first documents, requested and reviewed by the examination team during the onset of the exam. Your compliance manual should be a living document, and as such, it should be reviewed frequently and customized to your business. We've seen many firms who have purchased compliance manuals from third parties, so it's very important to customize the document. And when I say customize, I mean more than just simply changing the name at the top of the document. It's very important for you to go in and make sure that the policies and procedures described within the manual adequately describe how you supervise your business. A best practice is to sit down with your supervisors or the people identified within the manual prior to the exam start and make sure that they're familiar with the procedures and policies that apply specifically to their line of business. We've seen many findings cited because manuals are either not up to date 
or they do not accurately describe the supervisory process as employed. Supervision, suitability, and the fiduciary duty are also areas of focus that are not new. The regulators have had have these themes in the back of their minds as they conduct reviews during the exam to ensure clients' interests come first. We've seen particular attention and focus placed on complex products and proprietary products during exams. Firms should ensure that they have internal reviews and procedures that adequately identify any issues that could be that could pop up in these areas. Additionally, firms should take steps to ensure the resolution of issues identified, and that would also prevent reoccurrence of those issues. Recently, CCS has noticed an increased focus on code of ethics management during regulatory exams. Specifically, enhanced attention has been placed on outside business activities and personal securities transactions. The regulators have been paying particular attention to the analysis, reporting, and supporting documentation related to outside business activities and personal securities transactions. Firms should understand the nature of each outside business activity and ensure that the outside business activity does not constitute a personal securities transaction. We recommend that firms establish a process to periodically verify previously disclosed outside business activities. Additionally, a reconciliation of items that have been reported on the Form U4 to your current list of outside business activities is recommended, as this is an easy finding for regulators. Another area of focus is third-party oversight. We've seen many firms who use third parties for assistance in conducting email review, providing IT services, and for conducting AML reviews. While the regulators have taken no issue with the premise of using third parties, there is an expectation that firms conduct due diligence not only at the outset of the engagement, but periodically thereafter. Firms are being held responsible for monitoring the services provided and ensuring that third parties are abiding by the contracts executed between the, third, between the firm and the third party. Cybersecurity has been touched on by both uh, Doug and John previously in, in the presentation but it's, uh, we've also noticed that this is a regulatory area of focus. As we've mentioned, it is a hot topic and there's been a lot of guidance provided uh, by the regulators in this area. Cybersecurity is often complex and difficult for CCOs such as myself to understand. And as such, many firms have utilized the services of third-party service providers to assist. As I just covered in the third-party oversight section, we, firms need to ensure vendor management and due diligence processes are in place. And finally, make sure you're testing your cybersecurity processes and, and documenting those tests. We've seen many instances where firms are conducting cybersecurity testing, but they fail to document those tests. We want you to get credit for the things that you're doing, so make sure that you're, you're documenting who's doing the testing, what they're testing, what the findings are, and what steps have been taken to resolve those findings. Finally, regulators will focus on prior exam findings. This is a layup and an easy, easy um, finding for the examiners during these examinations. Failure to adequately mitigate previously identified issues is, is very simple, and firms should ensure that regulatory findings are included in their annual review process and documentation is maintained to evidence the issue resolution of these findings. As I mentioned, these are just a few of the common themes that CCS has identified in recent exams. Firms should refer to the annual exam priority letters for additional focus areas. Okay, great. Thanks, Jay. So Jay, we had a polling question go out while, while you were presenting. And the question was, when was the last time uh, your firm's compliance manual was updated? So here, here are the answers. Once again, pretty good news. Uh, in 2017, 63% of you have updated 2000, excuse me, 2017, 63%, 30% in 2016, and uh, the, the remaining is uh, prior to 2016 or un unsure. So uh, thank you, panelists, for your presentations. What I'd like to do is just 
just to change it up a little bit and uh, ask each of you to share a story with us about an examination or an experience that, that you've recently be, have been through that could help our, our listeners prepare and uh, for a, a future exam they may have. Doug, would you mind getting started? Sure thing. Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, for all of you in the room here who are compliance professionals, I'm sure it should come as no surprise that compliance is a 365-day-a-year responsibility. When executed properly, a compliance program reduces the overall level of stress for all associated parties. Communication and engagement are keys to this process. To the extent that you can effectively communicate and manage compliance-related processes with key internal and external stakeholders, you and your firm will be in a better position to stay even-keeled and avoid the stressful ups and downs surrounding your compliance deliverables. Make no mistake, though, this is hard work, and doing this is easier said than done. Compliance, in many cases, is not always at the highest priority within every organization. And as a firm, it is our job to stay on top of that program. One story that I can share with you that I think you may find valuable relates to a client who had hired us to provide consulting advice on their compliance program while in the midst of an ongoing regulatory exam. At the onset of our relationship with this client, it became apparent to us that effective communication and engagement in the compliance program was just not a priority. A few examples of what you don't want to do that we experienced with this client include they were regularly late for our weekly meetings and sometimes even failed to show up at all, our calls or emails were often not being returned, and the client was largely unresponsive to us during our onboarding process, whereby we request a list of documents so that we may begin to understand their business and the state of their program. In addition, we also learned from the regulator conducting their examination that prior documents that they had received from the client did not adequately address their questions. In the review of the follow-up correspondence with the regulator, it became apparent that any misinterpretation of their prior request could have been mitigated had our client been more proactive in communicating and clarifying with the examiner as to what it was they were actually looking for. It didn't take too long for us to convene a serious discussion with this new client about our concerns on their lack of responsiveness, communication, and engagement with their program. We stressed the importance of communication and how it would not only allow us to better access information we needed to carry out our responsibilities, but also make its current regulatory examination proceed more efficiently by eliminating the need for multiple follow-up questions and requests. The good news is following this meeting, we did see a marked improvement in the level of communication and engagement with this client. This allowed us to more efficiently manage their, pro their compliance program, and as well, their, their improvement in communication also helped expedite their document delivery to the regulator so that they could complete their examination. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Jay, uh, you want to visit for a second? You had some thoughts on, on the, the polling survey, just so the results and where they were trending? Uh, it's just a couple of thoughts. Yeah, is it you know, the, the polling question about the last time your firm's compliance manual is updated, you know, I would just say, you know, if you haven't updated it and you don't review that uh, document annually, uh, you, you're kind of playing with fire when the regulators come in um, because, it, as I mentioned, it is one of the first things that they look at. So you want to make sure that you're, you're reviewing that and touching that frequently. It is a living document and it should, it should change as your business changes. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. John, you have a story for us? Sure do, Rob. Um, so as a consultant, or whether we do it internally, we sometimes go back and forth among management of who and who isn't an access person. Um, from t here at Cipperman, we see it as a necessary evil of the investment industry, and really not very difficult hurdle to get over. Um, but we sometimes face that struggle. And I'm going to tell a, a little story in the view of an access person um, with the urban legend of the dreaded office tour by the regulators. As a CCO in my prior life, an exam team requested an office tour during the first day of their on-site on exam. As I escorted them around the office and introduced them to some of our people, they were taking notes, uh, writing down some observation, and writing down the names of the people that they met so that they could triangulate that off the information we provided. As we headed back to the conference room where they were sitting, we passed the kitchen and a person emerged right in front of the staff. They stopped, introduced themselves, and asked who this person was and what their role is. 
Me, knowing that this person was not affiliated with our business and simply shared our office space somewhere in the back, my mind started racing as to what the implications may be. This person used our office periodically and shared the copiers, printers, and most of the common areas with our employees. During my very next meeting with the staff, they asked me why this person was not listed as an access person. I danced carefully around the subject as I knew they had a strong motive behind the question. We then discussed the entry and exit points of our office along with the common areas and where our data, data is made available. It then became crystal clear to me that they were deeming this person an access person because they had physical access to information that could be available in the common areas or may overhear an employee conversation that can contain sensitive inside information. And this was the case because we were a family office and often dealt with executives of publicly traded companies. Their recommendation was to make this person an access person or build a physical barrier between them and our area, operational areas. My initial reaction was of shock. I could not believe that the regulators were now in the construction business. Our firm felt very strongly that we could not make this person adhere to the code of ethics and review their email and personal investment transactions on a timely basis. Therefore, we had to have the difficult conversation and move this person out of the office. This may be hard for some of you as you either have family or friends or colleagues in the industry sharing office space with you. But if there's a lesson to be learned here, before you parade the exam staff around the office, make sure you have a complete understanding of what they can, may, and will see along the way. Okay, awesome, thanks. Jay, how about you? Sure. I was involved in an exam where several layers of internal documentation review was required prior to providing that documentation to the regulators. Additionally, individual preparation was not conducted until the regulators requested a meeting with, spe with specific firm employees. As a result, documentation production was slow and interviews were not conducted as promptly as the regulators would have liked. The examination team shared the displeasure with senior management of the firm and additionally noted it in the final examination report. So the things that I learned from this experience are the following. Prepare ahead of time as much as possible. Train your employees prior to the on-site portion of the examination and do some mock interviewing and, and get them used to answering some of the questions that they may experience while they're there, while the examinations, while the examiners are on site. Secondly, stay organized. Obviously, this will assist in the timely production of documents to the regulators. And also, limit the amount of internal review of requested documentation by key personnel. It's important to review the documents that you're reviewing, that you're providing to the, to the examiners, but there's no need to have 10, 15 layers of that, of that review. Set realistic expectations with the regulators. There's many times that the regulators ask for documentation in specific formats. If you don't have the information in the format requested, that's okay, but it's important for you to let the examination team that you'll, you'll produce what they want, but that it may take additional time to do so. And importantly, if you give a timeline for the delivery of such documentation, make sure you stick within that time frame that you provide. And finally, communicate. My experience has shown that it's extremely important to communicate with the examination team. And the examination team appreciates knowing when documents will be produced and the status of any outstanding items. Okay, great, great, thanks. So let's go to uh, the questions that, are, that have been sent in so far, and I encourage the audience to continue to do so. We have a bunch to get started, but, but I bet we could handle a few more. So let me start this one out. Um, John, let me ask you. Our, our audience participant asked this question. Just yesterday, I received notice of an upcoming exam. The regulators have asked me for 17 documents. This seems like a lot. Is this customary? I would say 17 documents on the initial request list is about average. Okay. Um, I, I would say up to about 25 is a standard. We, we have the ability here at Sipperman to compare clients' request lists, and sometimes when we see routine exams, 
usually 20 of the 25 are the same, um, but I would say 17 is about average or, or good size for the initial request. Okay, good. John, I'll have you going. Hottest topics in the exams going right now. What are the, what are the, the hottest topics? So I'll, I'll jump okay. in. Okay. Okay. Right. So okay. you know, I think I, I touched on a few. Uh, obviously, cybersecurity, okay. um, sup, sup, supervision, suitability, and the, the WSPs are probably the big three that come to mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I put this out to the panel. Um, how do we treat the regulators? when they're on premises? Do we buy them lunch, dinners? Do we try to entertain them, or will they ignore us? Panelists? Sure, yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, no, when the regulators are on site, uh, in terms of you know, feeding them or anything like that, you, you typically just offer them the basic amenities, bottled water, uh, give them, make sure the conference room where they're gonna be spending their time is you know, comfortable, not too hot, not too cold. Um, but really, that's the extent of what I've experienced. You know, they will pretty much only accept, you know, sealed bottled water, and they, they bring their own. They, they brought their own coffees, and they go out to lunch every day. Uh, in my experience. Okay, here's another one for the panel. What happens if we get notified of an examination, and several of our key resources internally are going to be on vacation? Anyone on the panel want to try that one? So oh, I'll take that because okay, uh, it happened recently to me. Um, my experience is that, it, again, if you communicate with the examination team ahead of time and let them know that there's a potential conflict, um, you know, and a timing issue, uh, they will try to work with you. Uh, they obviously want to have the the people that they need to speak with and want to speak with on site while they're physically there. Um, so they don't want that piece of it to drag on. So. Um, you know, again, I would recommend have the conversation with the examination team. Let them know what works for you, and, and try to come to uh, a, a reasonable um, expectation of, of what works best. Okay, thank you. So here's a question that came in. I'll, I'll, I'll answer this one. It says, uh, "Do you recommend to your clients to perform uh, mock uh, mock SEC examinations?" And the second part of, what, of that question was, "Does Superman perform those?" So. It's always a good idea to be in a, in a uh, ready mode. So uh, mock examinations are always recommended. Uh, do we do them? Uh, we, we perform uh, many t types of, of tests throughout the year. Uh, on occasion, we do mock audits. Uh, as a rule, we generally, as a firm, we don't take on uh, uh, mock audits un unless it's a, a, a substantial uh, program. Uh, and it's really because of, of resource uh, challenges that uh, uh, we could be faced with. So, um, but but mock audits are always a, a, a good idea. So here's here's one uh, I'll put out to the panel. A after we complete an examination, what can we expect? H how long might it take to to hear the results, and how are those results shared with us? Yep. Doug, you want to handle that one? Yeah, I'll take that, Rob. Yeah, I, after the sort of initial way the on-site part of the examination has been completed, uh, you know, it varies. It depends on the scope of the examination. It, you know, kind of all does also varies on, you know, what information you have been able to provide to them to the extent that that satisfied their requests. Um, you know, as an example with the SEC, you know, they are, you know, they have by law, they're required to complete an examination, you know, within 180 days. Uh, so within a half year of sort of the last communication re regarding to the exam. Uh, for exams that, uh, you know, are pretty straightforward and they go smoothly, you know, you typically get that letter, you know, that, that sort of exit interview and letter much sooner than the 180 days. Um, and they could also go longer. Uh, you know, it could go it could go all the way up near the end of that 180 day period. So I think really it all depends on how that examination process goes, you know, with the initial del delivery of documents, if there's any follow-ups. Um, you know, to the extent that those are limited, um, you know, I think you'd expect within a few months you sh you're more likely not to get a, a conclusion. Okay, great, thanks. Um, here's one, Jay. I'm gonna I'm gonna fire this one at you. Uh, if you find you have not updated a policy in a while, and the regulators have no reason to see it, should you provide an updated version to the exam team? after you've made the updates. 
So it, it's kind of tricky. Um, you know, if it's not requested, I would say no. Um, you know, but but again, you have the obligation to maintain uh, current and and accurate policies and procedures. If it is requested, then by all means, uh, you know, produce it and, and show uh, that you've taken corrective action. I my experience during examinations is anytime you can correct an issue that's been brought to your attention while they're on site, um, they typically give you credit for it, and it it, it it benefits you in the long run. Okay, great, thanks. Here, here's one, John. Maybe you could you could try to help us out with this one. Do you expect the pace of examinations to increase, decrease, or remain the same there under the under the Trump regime? Sure, Rob. I think there's a few ways to look at it. I think under the current administration, it's not hidden that he wants to roll back regulation. Um, he has since made it harder for certain regulatory agencies to bring enforcement actions on how they do it, changing their ways that they do it. So with that said, I believe that examinations and policy will be driven by the regulators through exams. So I would, I would suggest that the pace of examinations will increase and the thoroughness of the actual examinations will, while we may see a downturn in enforcement actions or actions that deem have fines or some sort of penalties. Okay, thanks, John. So we've got time for just a, a couple more questions. This, this is a, a, a two-parter. Let me see if I can get through this. Uh, Jay, maybe I can I could aim this one at you. So how do others provide first-day materials to regulators, password, encrypted CDs, cloud-based application, other? And then the second part of that, also what regulatory agencies are the speakers talking about, FRB, state agencies, and other? I'll take the second question first. So I think it's safe to say that uh, we've been primarily talking about the SEC and FINRA um, during this presentation. Uh, as far as providing documentation to regulators, first day materials, um, both FINRA and the SEC have implemented um, electronic uh, documentation production um, tools on their websites. So uh, they're looking for most, if not all, of the documentation to be uploaded through their um, websites onto their platform um, and will go directly to the examination team in that fashion. Okay, great. Okay, great. Thank you all. Uh, so before we break away, uh, I wanted to uh, just bring up a few things. Uh, first of all, I would suggest uh, uh, that you um, stay on the line if you would like to have presentation from today sent to you. Uh, you can email that to me. Importantly, we have an upcoming uh, webinar coming up this fall on a very hot topic called cybersecurity. We think all of you would be very uh, interested in, in hearing what we have to say, what experts that uh, we, we have partnered with have to say, and how to put a program together no matter what the size of, of your organization, how, how to approach cybersecurity. And I guess the, just the final pitch is remember, if you need help with outsourcing uh, of, of compliance work, whether it's a CCO or a support team, you can t contact us uh, directly um, at 610-329-7598. That's my number, or, or find us on, on the web at uh, Sipperman.com. Again, thank you all for participating, listening in, and uh, we hope we brought value to your day. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.